Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is John Chambi. I'm a broadcaster with the Cubs and with ESPN. Want to welcome in uh, Oakland A's outfielder Stephen Piscotti and Dr. Merritt Sukovich from the Healy and AMG Center of ALS. She is the chief of neurology at Mass General. So today we're going to talk uh, about ALS. Um, Merritt, I guess the, the first thing to talk about is just at a basic level awareness. How is ALS diagnosed? Because I think a lot of people may not know the answer to that. Yeah, a ALS is what we call a clinical diagnosis, meaning it's, it's done by a neurologist, typically based on uh, someone's history and their clinical exam. We don't have, for example, like one test that tells you somebody has ALS. It's really the, the uh, clinical diagnosis. Uh, it, it takes way too long, I'll say, that, that we need to do better. Right now, it can take 12 months uh, from the first time someone has a symptom to when they're given the diagnosis, and that's 12 lost months. So important to make that better. Stephen, what do you remember about the process for your mother who you lost to ALS in terms of the, the diagnostic path? Yeah, it was, um, it was very confusing, I felt like. Um, I remember um, the onset for my mom was um, her inability to flex her foot um, kind of towards her face. And I remember her just being confused about it. And, um, you know, we kind of were like, ah. Oh, probably nothing. You're going to be fine. I remember going to a shoe store and work and trying to get these special ortho, um, ortho shoes to like, um, help with, with some of that flexion that she was having issues with. Um, and that just seemed to, it seemed to persist and, and get worse. And, um, my mom actually had a, a back surgery done because they thought there was a pinched nerve in her spine, um, that was causing, um, some of, uh, the issues. And I remember, <clears throat> going to the recovery room after that surgery. And, um, you know, the, the hope was that I was going to feel better, but there was something like immediately, it just seemed like, ah, that, that doesn't seem like, um, she's doing very well. And, um, you know, we started checking things off a list basically to see, you know, what it could be. And, you know, ALS was still on the list as, as we went. And, uh, I think MS was the last one that we finally checked off. And then, you know, it was basically a, a diagnosis just by, you know, eliminating other things. Um, and it was a long process, but, uh, you know, we didn't know I, probably about 12 months, just, uh, as you're saying, doctor. And what about treatment merit? What are some of the treatment avenues that people have nowadays? Well, there are, um, there are three drugs that are approved by the FDA that, that two of them slow down the illness a little bit and one helps with symptoms. And then there's what we call multidisciplinary care, like physical therapy, respiratory therapy, but we need more. I mean, uh, we don't have uh, treatments that stop the illness or reverse it, but we do have a few options for people to slow down the illness. What will it take to get to a point where you're somewhere in the neighborhood of a cure what, what, what types of things need to happen? Well, I think we have to put ALS research on uh, steroids. I mean, it's going much faster than it used to, and there's lots of good ideas, but there isn't enough, uh, I would say, funding and, uh, I guess, pressure to move faster. Um, you know, some of our patients tell us, we, we need to be on the ALS clock, and I believe that we need to be pushing things forward. And so that's going to be like more funding, some policy changes, attracting more people to the field because the science is there. We, we just need to push it much faster. Stephen, in terms of, you know, decline in condition, what were some of the things that you guys needed to do for your mom um, as it related to cost? You know, you were in a position where obviously you could offset that. Not everyone is in that in that position, but what were some of the things along the way that you had to buy or get or get insurance to buy? Yeah, I mean, there was a, a lot of um, necessary equipment. Um, you know, early on, it was just, you know, help walking. Um, you know, then once, you know, walking was was out of the, um, the question and she was, you know, in a chair, getting ramps to the house. Um, we purchased a new um, a minivan that had, uh, that was ADA accessible. 
Um, we sold her beloved uh, Audi that she um, loved driving to help fund a little bit of that. Um, you know, certain furniture in the home. Um, Lazy Boy makes a chair that you can kind of stand up without even getting up. So we had one of those. Um, we did feel fortunate, obviously, you know, being able to to um, you know purchase some of these things. There were a lot of things that we purchased that honestly just never got used. I remember um, purchasing um, a headset and a microphone. We were going to try to um, record a lot of her phrases and then um, try to have that um, that speech get, I don't know what the right word is, but created for her. Um, that just didn't end up panning out. Um, <clears throat> you know, later as the, the disease progressed, there was a lot of just uh, breathing equipment that was absolutely necessary. Um, and, and towards the end, that was kind of all the focus um, was on, on breathing. So um, there, were, there was a lot. And, you know, you, you walked into our home and you probably, if you were, if you knew us as a family and you walked in, you probably wouldn't recognize, you know, what was going on inside. Um, and it, it felt like a, a, ho a mini hospital in a way. And um, it was a lot. And we were very thankful to have the resources to provide all that so that, um, you know, during the progression, it was as good as it could be. Um, but, uh, you know, just very sad at the same time. And merit, I mean, the cost outside <laughs> of what insurance covers is, I mean, for mo the average ALS patient, it's, it's usually well into the six figures, is it not? Absolutely. And it's just what, what Stephen uh, described is, is, um, is equipment, but also people. Some people are blessed to have lar large families that can, that can care for them. Others, people have to, uh, to work and, or they don't have help and they need to get help. It's very expensive. Yeah, that, I lost my friend Tim Sheehy in 2007 and he helped found our charity project Main Street. And our charter is to help people living with the disease help to offset the cost because Tim and Katie, as his condition, you know, declined, he wasn't able, there were just so many things they couldn't afford. So that was really how our charity was born about. And, you know, my, my passion in this space in part has been to advocate for awareness and research, but also to help the living because there are plenty of people like your world just gets smaller and smaller. You know, that's the other thing is that your condition, you can't, you get to see fewer and fewer people. Yeah, we need both care and, and cure. Yeah. Yep. Um, what, if, if you were to express to people like the, the public, what's something about ALS that people don't understand um, it, that, you know, you'd like to put out there. I, I can maybe start. I'll say one thing is I, I think people don't realize, uh, and I don't want to scare anyone, but how common it is. Uh, while we typically think of it as a rare disease, it's an illness that can happen to really anyone in any country, any, um, race, and it gets more common as we age. So as the population is aging, it's getting more common. The lifetime risk of this illness is one in 300 for men um, and one in 400 for women. So this is, this is I would say, kind of a crisis. Like we really do have to solve this illness because the numbers are going up. Um, and, and it is one of the worst illnesses I think we see in, in neurology. Stephen, anything in particular that, you know, you'd, you'd like to get out there about ALS uh, for the general public? Yeah, and I, I don't want to scare anyone either, but one thing I remember while my mom was sick um, was just how brutal the disease was, um, you know, the amount of suffering I felt like, um, you know, it's really hard to talk about that stuff, you know, in the public, and, you know, you don't want to dwell on that and, you know, dampen everyone's, you know, spirits and whatnot, but it's, it's incredibly hard to watch, and, um, you know, our family saw it firsthand and, um, you know, that was, that was just very difficult. And, um, you know, in, the, in the public, it's probably seen as a fatal disease. Um, but I don't know if the, the suffering that happens gets overlooked. I'm not sure. Um, but that's one thing that I remember while my mom was sick was thinking about like, wow. Um, I don't know if anyone knows, you know, really what's going on here. And Merritt, um, can you talk a little specifically about, the work your team is undertaking to 
I guess, move the understanding and treatment for ALS forward? Yes, uh, so we have two initiatives that are um, centered at the Healy Center at Mass General, but involve centers all over the United States. And they're both uh, geared towards uh, giving uh, options for experimental treatments for people so that everybody with ALS has an option if they want to. So one of them is a platform trial where we test multiple treatments in the same structure to really accelerate uh, getting uh, to the answer. So this cuts down time in about half to get into effective treatments. And the other is doing a parallel compassionate use program called an expanded access program where if someone isn't eligible for a trial, they can still get access to that um, treatment uh, on a compassionate use basis so that nobody goes to center and is told there's nothing to do. That, that's really our goal. And Stephen, what, what would you like to see in terms of uh, you know, pushing forward to help finding a cure? I guess specifically besides money, awareness is huge to making people aware um, Tell me something that, that you'd like to, to let people know um, about getting involved in any way, shape or form to kind of, you know, move the needle. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, our, our organization, the ALS Cure Project is focused on a cure and, and hopefully getting to that point. Um, you know, I think with, you know, the, the funding and the awareness you know, hopefully it's going to uptick here, but, you know, it is, you know, rather low. I would, I would love to see, you know, in the research space, you know, more collaboration between um, organizations. I think that, um, you know, when the resources are so small um, to empower that and to leverage that, you know, working together, um, I think is something that, that needs to be done. And that's just kind of our take after kind of analyzing the space, um, you know, from a charitable perspective and, um, you know, I think that could help move the needle um, a good amount. We need, you know, the smart people um, with the with the resources working on this together. Yeah, smart and resources are two of the, the big things for sure. Um, I, I guess to, to each of you, Stephen, start with you. For somebody with ALS, how can family and friends best support the person that has the disease? I think just being there. Um, I mean, there's, there's a, a lot you can do, obviously, financially to support people, but just being there, um, you know, when my mom was ill, um, you know, I felt like part of my job was just uh, hosting people that wanted to come by and say hello. And that meant, um, you know, the world to my mom um, just every day. I mean, we had people flying in from Texas, New York, all over. And um, I know that it meant a lot to her and, and, um, you know, just showing how much you care for a person and, and being there. And honestly, you know, a lot of those conversations were just a distraction from, you know, what was going on. And that, that was also huge. So, um, you know, there's so many things you can do, but just being there and supporting is, is, is plenty. Merit. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd say the same, uh, being there, uh, you know, sometimes when, when, when you have a friend who's sick, can be a little scary to go there. And, and we see that sometimes and you have to push through that and be there for your friend or your family, uh, find out what they need, offer things. Sometimes it's actually just saying, listen, I'm gonna do the research on the trials and the treatments, or I'm going to find out what care. You know, just, just find ways that you can help, but, um, but um, don't stop going and visiting and, and being present. Yeah, go see them. I think sometimes they kind of, they feel forgotten. I think the people that, that have the disease and less people have access to them because they can't move to go out, you have to go to them. So I think that, that I'd echo that. Um, the, to both of you, what specifically can Major League Baseball do to help bring awareness to ALS, to helping, you know, find a cure, to help people living, but just if anything you have in terms of what Major League Baseball can do with you know, Lou Gehrig Day coming up uh, June 2nd, but uh, Merritt, your thoughts there. I, first of all, thank you for doing it. It's huge. I think there's two things. One is the awareness because I know the Ice Bucket Challenge uh, put the word ALS out there, but I think people still don't really know what it is. So uh, kind of what Stephen said, showing the world what it is, what the illness is and how important it is to uh, fund research and care. 
And the second would be by raising awareness, you're raising funds and support for people with ALS and for the cures and for the research. I think MLB, obviously with the Lou Gehrig's day, I mean, that's a huge step and we're, we're so excited. Um, thrilled really. Um, it's going to be an awesome, awesome day. And I think the, the thing that I was, um, uh, most excited about was to hear it's going to be an annual thing. And I, you know, sometimes these things come up, um, whether it is an ice bucket challenge where it is a, a one-time thing, it was incredibly impactful, but you know, that, that, um, you know, annual constant reminder, um, and MLB having that, that day every year, I think is, is just huge. So, um, I'll have to think on what else they can do. They're doing a lot. So I'm pretty happy. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's all I got. Yeah. Awareness is, is amazing. You guys will be in Seattle, uh, taking on the Mariners on June 2nd. Um, I will be in Chicago. The Cubs, uh, play the Padres at Wrigley field. And, um, I think it'll be an exciting day, an emotional day, powerful. I know, you know, Stephen, like one of the things that jumps out in my head is just from an awareness standpoint, I know it's hard to sit there with the way, you know, your life's been impacted by the disease, but from a long game standpoint, if an 11 year old kid sees those letters and asks his dad, what is ALS? Like we're making some progress there, you know, like just to get people out there to know what this disease is, Merritt, I think so important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, you said that very, very well. Yep. Um, thank you too so much for doing this. Um, we look forward to, uh, to seeing you down the line. We look forward to, to June 2nd, Lou Gehrig Day in Major League Baseball, and we'll raise uh, a lot of awareness and hopefully funds to find a cure uh, Dr. Merit Sukovich from the Healy Center at Mass General. Thank you. Stephen Piscotti of the Oakland A's. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much.